Good morning. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. If you don't have a traditional Bible but you'd like one, just raise your hand and one of my friends will bring you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift to you. You can also take your digital device and open up the U version, or it's also called the Bible app and all the notes and scriptures have already been uploaded. If you are watching us live on our online campus or at one of our many services at the Brown County Correctional Facility or at our Howard Swamico site, welcome. We love you. So glad that you guys are part of our family and welcome to you. We love you. So glad that you are part of our extended family, so excited about what God's doing in the 920 and so excited about how so many of our sites are just recreating the way that church is done. I think we're going to need to do that as culture changes. We're going to need to kind of recreate ourselves, keep the message the same, but keep the method different, adjust the way that we do things so that we can reach more people faster for Jesus. And so thank you guys for being fluid. Thank you guys for being adjustable. Thank you guys for being people who love people enough to do things in a creative way. And so uh, I hope that you've really liked this series. I've loved this series. I didn't know that I would love this series as much coming into it as I love it now that we're in it. And I think partially because I really love this idea. I love this concept. I love this uh, proposition, if you would, that we have kind of presented in question format to consider for ourselves that, that what would you do if you knew you had one month to live. And I've got to have some very interesting conversations with people. Some of those have been face-to-face. Some of those have been over the phone. Some of those have just been back and forth with texts or with emails. Some really interesting conversations about this idea. And one of the things that I've found to be the most interesting that I've discovered in this process and in those conversations is that most of the people who I've talked to talk more about what they wouldn't do if they knew that they had one month to live than they've talked about what they would do. For example, they wouldn't watch as much TV. They wouldn't spend as much time on the internet or on their cell phones. They wouldn't spend as much time at work. They they wouldn't dwell on their differences or major on the minors. They wouldn't have to always be right and they wouldn't hold as many grudges. What they would do is they would travel. So many people have said that. It's almost been a universal response, actually. But what's interesting is it hasn't been like, you know, I'm, I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to go to Australia because I've never seen the Great Barrier Reef. I'm talking about people who are like, if I knew that I had one month to live, man, I'd pack my kids in the car. We'd go to the Dells, bro. I'm like, what? <laughs> they're right there. Like, they're open. On Friday, Saturday, Sunday, skip church, watch us online. You could be our Lazy River campus. I mean, are you kidding me? You'd have to have one month to die to go to Olympus? Like, like let's just be reasonable about it. But a lot of people said uh, that they would travel. One thing that people would do is they would spend time with family and friends. They would eat at the dinner table. They would go to the park or the library on walks or bike rides. They'd apologize. They'd ask for forgiveness. If they knew that they had one month to live, they'd have more meaningful conversations and make more memories. People said that if they had one month to live, they'd give more compliments. They'd record more videos. I thought that was interesting. There's an app that my wife, I wish that she had invented it, but she uses it as if she had invented it. It is called Marco Polo. It is just like this great video. It's like texting, but it keeps you from texting while you're driving, except I don't know if it's safer to record videos while you're driving or if it is safer to text. Not saying that she records videos while she's driving if you're law enforcement in here, which interesting story. <laughs> My friend Steve, we call him Pastor Steve, he's, he's our facilities director, he, uh, he drives a truck that I used to drive, same license plate, and uh, as you know, I've gotten pulled over a couple of times by the same law enforcement agent who the second time when he pulled me over for speeding, he said, seriously, it's you again? And so uh, Steve got pulled over the other day, not for speeding, but because uh, the tags on his truck, the, the 20 had fallen off. And so uh, when the officer walked up to the window, he said, Sean. And I thought, ha, I'm infamous. This is great. If I had 30 days to live, I'd never go the speed limit. Let me just say that. So anyway, don't, don't record that. There's people like, uh, uh, so she doesn't record the Marco Polos, I don't think, while she's driving. But this this really interesting kind of 
dialogue that you can have and you can record and you can keep record of where you can see each other's face and you can see each other's, uh, the way that you communicate and the look on your face. And, and uh, that reminded me of this movie that I'd seen a million years ago uh, called My Life with Michael Keaton. And, and uh, Michael Keaton discovered that he, he was terminal and he was going to die, but he, he realized that he hadn't taught his kids everything that he wanted to teach them. And so he got an old school camcorder and he set it up and he just started to record things that he thought would be interesting or necessary later on. Like, like who's going to teach my son how to shave or who's going to teach my kids how to balance a checkbook. And I thought that was interesting as people said that they'd record more videos. People said that they'd write more letters. You know, there's something powerful about the written word. My, my dad, he's such a loving and beautiful guy, but he's, he's not boisterous. Him and I differ in that way. I take after my mother. My mother's a very outspoken person and she communicates her feelings very clearly. But my father, sometimes you wonder what he's thinking. And when I was a freshman in college, my father sent me a letter. It was a, a card, a thank you card. And, and at the end of that thank you card, he wrote, I love you and I'm proud of you. And that card, that was, that was like 27 years ago. And that card still is carried in my wallet every day of my life. That card goes everywhere. That card has been all over the world because there was something in those words. I knew he, I knew he thought them, but when he wrote them, it was something so significant to me. It's one of my most cherished possessions. And so people said if they knew that they had one month to live, they would write people more letters, more notes, more cards. And so in thinking about this idea, what we've said so far is that if we knew that we only had one month to live, we would live passionately, we would learn humbly. And today I wanna actually present this thought as a question and say, if you knew that you only had one month to live, would you love completely? Let's pray. God, we love you. We're grateful to you. Thank you that you love us completely. You don't hold back. Not only do you love us completely, you love us fully, God, and you loved us first. And so today, God, thank you for your love. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It never changes. His mercies never come to an end. And so today, I pray that we would reflect that, that we would radiate that, God, that, that those things would bounce off of us and project onto other people, that the people who are in our proximity would know that they are loved unequivocally and completely. And so God, today, as we become small and you become big, let our hearts and our minds and our lives be changed in Jesus' name, amen. Love completely. I am a proponent of love, a defender of love, a, a champion, if you would, of love. I am a lover of love. I love love. In fact, I love, I'm a chick flick love guy, I'm a, which I think it's a little bit offensive that we call those chick flicks. Like, why is it that, that men aren't able to love in such an outward way that that becomes a feminine thing? But that's a whole nother conversation. I'm not talking about romantic comedy. Like, I'm a, I'm a chick flick love guy. Like, one of my favorite movies, and it is infamous, one of my favorite movies. I was so offended when I heard that Netflix was going to change the ending is The Notebook. It is one of the greatest movies of all time to the point that Pastor Sonny was in Charleston a few weeks ago and she called me and she said, you're not going to believe this. We're like right at the place where they filmed the notebook. And like how many wives could say to their husband, are you this? You, I wish that you were here. Not, I'm in the place where they filmed Rambo. Like I'm in the place where they filmed the, and she knew that that would be, I would be so jealous of that. But don't you love people who love? Uh, everybody's got one of them in their life. Maybe for you, it's your grandma. For you, it's a teacher. For me, unequivocally, it's, it's Pastor Sonny's dad. My father-in-law, Jack, he is the champion of love. He, when you meet him, uh, just being in his presence feels like you're in an embrace. It, it feels like the minute that you meet him, his love just jumps all over you. Like he, he's a name user. He, he learns people's names. And the, the minute that you meet him, he, he makes eye contact and he doesn't break it. And he doesn't want to talk about him. He wants to talk about you 
and he'll find out your name. And he does this even with servers at restaurants and makes them feel like they are worth $10 million. And, and when he meets you, if he shook your hand, he'd, he'd find out your name and, and, and he'd, say, he'd say your name like literally awkwardly so many times. And he will remember your name when you could be five years and you'll see him again. And something about the love that he has just makes him remember that you are who you are and makes you remember that you are who you are and that you're significant. And so when I get around uh, Sonny's dad, I just, I just feel so loved. And we love people who love. And the reason for that is because that is hardwired in us to love. The quintessential characteristic of God in 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Well, if God is love, then how do you describe or how do you define love? Gratefully, we don't have to guess. That was told to us particularly, it's throughout the scripture, but really in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it is the love chapter. And it is, it is uh, one of my life verses, really. Everyone, whether you know it or not, you have a life verse, a verse that defines you. My kids would probably both tell you that one of their life verses is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your paths straight. And so 1 Corinthians 13, I've tried to incorporate that and, and make that one of my life verses. It's the love chapter. It says, love is patient and it's kind. It's not jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep record or, or uh, track of being wrong. It doesn't delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres, and it will last forever. And the reason that it lasts forever is because it will never fail. And so many of us know that scripture, we've read that scripture, we can recite that scripture, we've heard that scripture, we've heard it at a wedding, we read it in a Valentine's card that you bought from a Christian bookstore, if those still exist, that we've heard it so many times that it's become white noise. It's, it's become a background music like smooth jazz at the dentist where it just blends in. And so, so this week I actually asked my kids, uh, I texted them, actually, because that's, you know, we all know that that's the easiest way to communicate. And so I, I texted them and I said, uh, what do you think love is? Now, four years ago, I asked them the exact same question. They probably didn't remember that. But when they answered me, I actually kept their answers in my phone because there were some things, there are just some things that are significant, at, at least as a father. And for example, I, I have some things saved on my phone from my kids. I have voicemails saved from my kids. Like six years ago, I was blessed to be able to go to Okinawa, Japan and speak at Camp Foster Marine Corps Base. And on my way back, when I hit Tokyo, I turned my phone on and there was a message from my daughter, her little sweet, tiny little voice. And she had heard that in Tokyo, they have bubble tea. And would I be so kind as to bring her back a bubble tea? You've, first of all, when she said that, if she would have asked me to bring her back Mount Fuji, I would have been out there with a shovel and a pickaxe and a bat and be like, oh, where, what do you have to claim? This is just Mount Fuji. Just my daughter wanted this, so can, it, can this be my carry-on? All she wanted was a bubble tea. And so for 14 hours on flights, I carried a bubble tea. By the time I got home, it wasn't no bubbles. It was just juice. But by the time I got home, I, I, could, I couldn't resist. And I still have that message on my phone. Daddy, when, uh, if you could bring me home bubble tea, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. I love you. Bye. That will never not be on my phone. I'm just saying. And uh, I had knee surgery a few years ago. And my son, Isaiah, he called me on the phone uh, while they were prepping me. And he was on his way to school. And I have a voicemail of his little cute voice uh, praying for me and tell, telling me by the time you get this message, you'll already be out of surgery. Everything will have been fine. We're praying that we just love you by. That will never, like there's just something, some things you just, you just keep that stuff. And so four years ago, I asked them, what do you think love is? And I kept the answers in my phone. And this is what my son Isaiah said four years ago. He said, I think love is getting gifts, being touched and spending time. 
I think love is passionate and compassionate. I think it's caring, careful, and controlled. I think it's fruitful and fulfilling. I think love is fun. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I love that. Love is fun. If you're not having fun, you don't know what love is. And so this week, he responded and he said, love is having someone in your life that's like a safety blanket, who if you have time, you want to give that time and spend it with them. He said, love is connecting yourself with someone to where you'll do favors for them that you wouldn't do for others. It's making yourself available for a person even when you're not available. He said, love is kindness and thoughtfulness. Four years ago, my daughter Aubrey said this. She said, I think love is honest, giving, and nice. I think it's joyful, it's faithful, it's real, it's beautiful. I think it's not easy. I think love is sweet, generous, and gentle. This week, she responded and she said this. I think love is patient. I think love is blind. I think love is contagious. Oh my gosh, that is so sick, isn't it? That's, it's like, you better shut your mouth. I will, I will run all over this building right now. Love is contagious? Are you kidding me? What are you, Bob Goff? This is awesome. <laughs> Uh, that's the greatest picture. Love is fun. Love is contagious. And, and, I, and I thought about this movie that I accidentally watched last week. I, every Monday I try to take a day off and uh, Sonny works on Mondays. And so it's usually just me at the house. And so like I try to watch uh, a movie and just turn my brain off. And I stumbled upon this movie from 2011. It's called Contagion. And so I don't know why I watched it with the whole corona thing going on, but I watched it and was terrified, ordered all the masks and all the hand sanitizer that Amazon had to order. It's like ridiculous. And in this movie, from like 2011, everybody in it's famous. It's like Lawrence Fishburne and Matt Damon and Gwyneth Paltrow. And in this story, this woman goes for a business trip to Hong Kong. And, and when she closes the deal, they go to dinner and they celebrate. And the chef comes out and she meets the chef and she shakes hands with the chef. And then, and then she rubs her nose. And next thing you know, she has this strain of some sort of a virus that don't want to wreck the movie for you but a bat bit a pig and then the pig got served uh, at the casino and she ate the bat pig and then she got sick from the bat pig and then she got in a airport and uh, she sneezed and when she sneezed like half the airport got sick and by halfway through the movie 12.5 million people have the bat pig disease and they're trying to figure out because they don't have any cure for it and I thought that reminds me a lot of love just takes one person. It just takes one person to determine that they're going to go to work tomorrow and they're going to love everybody. It just takes one person to wake up tomorrow and say that they're going to change the way that they deal with their spouse. And rather than being angry, rather than keeping record of wrong, they're going to wake up and they're just going to unequivocally love without any boundaries towards it. And once one person starts to love like crazy, then one, one more person will start to love like crazy. And then another person will start. And next thing you know, we've got all kinds of people who are infected with love. Because don't we love to be around people who are contagious? People who have a laugh or a joy or a smile that is contagious, that's what I want to be. I want to be contagious and I want you to be too. I want us to love completely. So what I want to do today is I want to give you three characteristics of love so that we can become contagious. Here's the first, is that love is a choice. We have, we have somehow bought into this myth and this idea that love is uncontrollable. That it's something that just happens to us. Even the language that we use about love implies the uncontrollability of love. Well, I fell in love as if it was a pit that you didn't see that was covered by leaves. And next thing you knew, you were at the bottom of it with the broken leg and you couldn't recover from it. I fell in love. And I think that's why so many people think that you can fall out of love. Because if you can fall into something, then you can fall out of it. Because love is, you know, uncontrollable. Now, since most of us think that love is a feeling, we have a perception of what we think love is or what we want love to be. Like most of us want that chick flick love, that sleepless in Seattle love, that I will wait for you at the top of the space needle kind of love, that thumper Bambi Twitter pated love with all the animals gathering and the birds carrying ribbons through the forest and songs being sung and time standing still. That kind of love. You know what I'm talking about. I got a little prop today. I don't usually use props, but Pastor Lori found this and she texted it to me. And so I thought this would be the perfect opportunity. If you came in here with a brown paper bag, by the way, somebody's stopping you. Just FYI. <laughs> because I run the place, they let me have a brown paper bag. And so she, this is for anybody under 40. 
This is the original iPhone. And, and, and I'm talking about everybody wants that. Better put it on this side. By the way, I did clean the ear and the mouth because I don't know how old Corona is. And so the, I'm talking about people want this kind of love. You know what I'm talking about? All the ladies are like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about that fall asleep with your phone under your ear kind of love. You know what I'm talking about? Remember when phones were connected to walls and they had, this is a teenager phone right here. That's all I'm saying. This, this is a hide around the corner phone. Look how long this cord is. <laughs> you could be in the garage with this phone. <laughs> hey. <laughs> when your parents come in and see a cord like that and the cord is tight, the cord is taut, they know something's going on. They know you're in the pantry and you're not getting chips is all I'm saying. <laughs> Remember when love was like this, when you were on the phone and you heard this? <laughs> and two people could be on the same line at the same time and you could be spitting game. I'm talking about nobody was better at phone game. Hey girl, <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> Bobby, Bo hello, hello, Bo and you, you will never have been more, mom, I'm on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to? Mom, <laughs> I'm on the phone, <laughs> I can never go to school again. <laughs> and you hear this sweet sound of, Oh my gosh, that was my mom. I'm so sorry. Uh, like, like your 13-year-old girlfriend thinks you live alone. You know what I'm saying? Uh, oh my gosh, that was my, she's such a loser. I hate, I hate my mom. And like, really? So you need a ride to the mall and then you love your mom again. You know that, that love when you stayed on the phone all night just to hear them breathe. Somewhere along the line, something changed though. Because in the middle of the night, you start doing this. Would you shut up all that breathing over there? You cut out all that breathing over there. And somewhere along the line, that breath that used to be intoxicating has become intolerable. It has become common. And we're like that with God, too. In Job 32, it says, I thought those who are older should speak for wisdom comes with age. But there's a spirit within people. Watch this the breath of the Almighty within them that makes them intelligent. But sometimes the elders are not wise. Sometimes the aged do not understand justice. And he's saying that age doesn't always equal wisdom. I remember Sonny's grandfather, when we first got married, saying these words to me, well, I told Big Mama I loved her the day that we got married, and if anything changes, she'll be the first to know. Number one, men. I know we just came back from men's retreat. I should have spoke on this. You don't never call your wife Big Mama. That's the question. <laughs> Number one. And second of all, you don't need to tell her the day that y'all got married and if anything changes, you'll let her know. Love is more than a feeling. It's a choice. It's why in the great commandment, Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second one is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, love God, love others, love yourself with all your heart and your mind because love is a choice. It's a choice when they have nappy hair and makeup smeared, when they have croutons in their eyes and drool caked on their cheek. It is a choice. It's a choice when you don't get the promotion or you don't get the house, when you lose your job or you lose the baby. When the doctor brings a negative report, love is a choice. And so we have to choose to love God, to love others, and to love ourselves completely. Here's the second characteristic of love is that love is a commitment. I have some friends, they're so cute, they've been married for 65 years. And I asked the wife one time, I said, how? In a world where people fall in and out of love all the time, how have y'all stayed married 65 years? She just kind of shrugged. She said one day at a time. Lamentation says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end, they are new. Every morning, great is his faithfulness. Love is a commitment. So we have to choose to get over some stuff. Listen, it's so unnatural for two people from two different backgrounds to come and live together and think that they're never going to have disagreements. But why are you carrying that? She said that seven years ago. Could you just 
get over it. In fact, let me give you three things that we need to choose to get over. First, we need to get over misunderstandings. Most people don't mean to do you wrong. Things are often lost in translation. In fact, the word misunderstanding is a compound word. So when we have a misunderstanding, it means we missed the understanding. Can we just get over misunderstandings? Next, we have to choose to get over mistakes. Most offenses are not malicious. Most offenses are mistakes. Why are we making mountains out of molehills? You know, whatever you focus on gets bigger. People are going to make mistakes all the time, every day. I make them every day. You make them every day. So can we just get over them and others? Well, for me to be able to do that, I have to choose to get over me. You know, we hold other people at higher standards than we hold ourselves. And I think we do that because we view them through the lens of our insecurities. But the world is not out to get you. The world is not talking about you. The world is not conspiring against you. It isn't plotting against you. So if I'm going to love completely, I have to get over me and realize that love, it is a commitment. Here's the third characteristic of love. Love is a calling. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore I, this is Paul the apostle, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life that's worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other and make allowances for each other's faults. Why? Because of your love. And so I am called to love you. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter what beliefs are different than mine, no matter what practices are different than mine, I am called to love you completely, and you are called to love me completely. But what does it mean to be called? It means that God's asking you to do something. That's it. And so on a spiritual level, God called me or God asked me to be a pastor, to spend my life communicating his word with others. But on a practical level, God called me to do that here in Green Bay. And so God calls some people or he asks some people to be doctors or to be teachers or to be lawyers or to be stay-at-home moms. But in a practical sense, God has called all of us to love. He's asking all of us to love each other. I mean, let's just think about this. Isn't it exhausting to be around people who bicker and argue, fight and compete, complain, people who just don't get along? You know, what's interesting about love is that it requires some concessions. So Jesus said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for their friends. It takes laying down our thoughts and our agendas. If you had one month to live, you would have no problem laying those things down. So the question is, why don't we do that now? Why don't we make a commitment? Why don't we make a choice? Why don't we just decide today we are going to love completely? We do that today? Would you close your eyes all across this place? Love completely. At its core, that's a characteristic of what the church world would call salvation. Salvation, a rescuing. Have, have you been saved? That's a, that's a term in church. Have you received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And sometimes we don't understand that when we know those terms, other people don't. So let me just briefly describe to you what that means. If you want to go to heaven, you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Scripture says that none will come to the Father except through him. So what does that mean to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That he wants to talk to you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to be a part of your life every single day. But you have to invite him in. Revelation says, yea, though I stand at the door and knock, if you open it up, I will enter in and dine with you as friends. And so this morning, you have an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus, to make him the Lord and Savior of your life. Here's what that means. When someone is your Lord, that means they are in control. They are in charge. When someone is your Savior, that means they are the ones who rescued you from whatever it is you needed to be rescued from. Some of you are here and you need to be rescued from sin or shame. And this morning, 
we're gonna give you opportunity to delete and erase all of those things from your life. So this morning, here's how we're gonna do that. We're gonna give people an opportunity to do two things. Confess and profess. Confess that they are sinners and profess that Jesus can change that. And so here's how we're gonna do that. In just a minute with nobody looking around, I'm gonna ask for people who wanna confess that they're sinners, their lives are not right, they need to change. We're gonna do two things. First, I'm gonna ask people to raise their hand and make eye contact with me. Once you've made eye contact with me in a moment, you can put your hand down. That's your image of confessing that you're a sinner. Then I'm gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna invite everybody in this place to repeat that prayer after me. If you repeat that prayer after me and you mean it in your heart, scripture says you're saved. You begin this beautiful journey away from who you are toward who Jesus is. So if you're here and you say, Sean, I'm a sinner, I'm not saved, but I'd like to be, with nobody looking around, would you raise your hand and make eye contact with me today? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thanks, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thanks, thank you, thank you, thanks, 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 thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Did I miss any? Thank you. Did I miss anybody? Okay. I'm going to ask everyone in here to say these words after me. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Come into my life and change me. Make me new. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, Scripture says you are saved. You begin this new journey and we would love the opportunity to walk that with you so in the seat back in front of you or underneath your chair in the very front or very back rows there is a card that says hello across the top that you just tear off the bottom part fill it out check the box that's highlighted in yellow that says I'm choosing to follow Jesus put it in the black buckets when they come around in a minute or you could take it out to the welcome center either way we want the chance to follow up on you we want the chance to pray for you we also have a packet for you inside that packet there's a CD that's about a 12-minute presentation on what you're, what you're supposed to do from this point forward. There's a book in there, and there's also a devotional, which if you haven't gotten this, we have enough of these for everybody. It's a three-month devotional, March, April, and May, where every day there's a little scripture and there's a little article, and you would love. It's just a really simple way for you to start out your day with Jesus. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes again. Don't leave. We're not done. Pastor Sonny's going to close us in just a second, but I wonder if you're hearing you say, Sean, I'm saved. I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl, but you've struggled in the love category. You could say, Sean, I kind of love, but maybe you haven't been loving completely. Have you been holding back in any area of your life? If that's you, I want the opportunity to pray for you. So if you're here and you say, Sean, I haven't been loving completely, but I'd like to, just raise your hand and I want to pray for you today. Yep, yep. God, for so many people, God, I pray blessings on them, peace over them. God, give us the ability to love like you love so we can live the way that you want us to live. Help us love completely in Jesus' name. Amen.